everybody. I am Nicola, also known as Nico, Dr. Rinaldi. I've got all kinds of names. Um, author of the book, No Period, Now What? Um, which I hope you already have, but if not, we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that are in it in this call. Um, so I'm really excited to be joined by my friend Florence. Florence and I have known each other for, I think, like 10 years now. Has it really been that long? Um, yeah. So we met on the Fertile Thoughts board, like back before I'd even written No Period, Now What? Um, and Florence had HA and, you know, we, we got to know each other there. Um, she has one of the most incredible birth stories that I have ever heard. She had her daughter prematurely in the car, like, oh my God. So <laughs> like, that's just amazing. And she's happy and healthy now, which is incredible. Um, but so Florence, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what your, uh, about your journey through HA and um, what you're doing now? Yeah, yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Um, so as you said, we, I was in HA land 10 years ago. And at the time, I was desperately looking for information online, and there really wasn't much. And I actually came across your blog at the time, uh, reached out to you, and um, this is how I got on the Fertile Thoughts Forum, which was really super helpful to me. Um, I was told at the time that there was really, you know, that the doctors didn't really know what to do with me, and, uh, you know, it, it was definitely great that I could find you and all the other women uh, on the forum. I'm very grateful for that. That's why also I'm a big advocate of your work. I think it's super important to so many women. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so I did, did recover uh, in 2010. So it took me about 15 months to, um, you know, recover. I have to mention that I was only all in for about five or six months. So I kind of spent a year mm -hmm. pondering out what I should do and of course very scared of letting go of the uh, you know the figure uh, I had worked on so mm -hmm. strong um, but then once I was all in I recovered and then the beauty of it was that I recovered and on my second cycle I actually conceived uh, my first child so um, you know that all went went really well. I had those two babies very close apart, uh, close together. You know, I had them about a year apart. And then, um, and then, yeah, I kind of uh, stopped breastfeeding after my second. And then I had always suffered from acne. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you keep reading online how how dairy is the problem and gluten is the problem and you need to cut down so many different food groups that I went down the rabbit hole again um, and of, obviously it was not the same it was not about losing weight it was health mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, but it got me very sick again so I would say that I relapsed at that time uh, between 2014 and 2016 and then by 2016 again my cycle had become quite wonky I didn't completely lose my period but it was very unpredictable and very long cycles and I felt like okay no I'm not going back there so uh, the difference between the first recovery and the second recovery is that I made um, a lot of work on mental health mm -hmm. um, which was really the root of a lot of the low self-esteem and lack of body confidence and the wish to constantly biohack my body into doing different things. Yeah. So um, when I went on my final recovery, I learned about so many different concepts that I didn't know about. I learned that there was a different way to health than just controlling your weight and being careful of what you eat and micromanaging all your food intake and micromanaging how much exercise you do and all of that and um, from there I mean I felt so cold to just really go and help other women with that knowledge um, and so I became a certified eating psychology coach. Uh, and this is why uh, today I'm taking part of in this call with you. Um, because a lot of what I do is actually supporting women in their journey to uh, a better body image. 
uh, a better self-esteem, a better way to deal with anxiety outside of controlling food and exercise and their bodies and telling them that they can also reach health uh, without having to look too much into weight, BMI and exercising and looking a certain way and that they need to really reclaim the space that each of us has to take as women. Because when women take the space that they're allocated, you know, really expand into the things that they're called and meant to do, then uh, it trickles down to so many different people around them. And obviously, my kids was a big motivation behind my final recovery. Mm -hmm. So I'm here to talk to you about all of these things to support people that you help uh, physiologically um, and uh, help them really gain the mental freedom that they might have never known um, with food and their bodies. So, um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you would like to add about the way we, you know, will work together specifically. Do you, so we have a list of questions that we were asked on Instagram and our Facebook. Um, so we're going to try and get through everything. We'll see how it goes. Um, but we're each going to kind of jump in on the questions that are sort of pertaining to our expertise. Um, and I did want to share that Florence and I are going to be working together and offering you guys um, the opportunity to work with both of us, which I think will be really helpful because I'm very strong on sort of the diagnosis side, figuring out what you need to do for recovery. Um, certainly on the fertility stuff, but not so much on the mental aspect and the body image and all of that. And that is really Florence's strength. So uh, we're going to be offering some packages where, you know, depending on what you're looking for and what's really best for you, you might work for four sessions with me and two with Florence or vice versa, or, you know, we can really tailor what, tailor it to whatever it is that's going to most help you. Because honestly, that's our like biggest like that, that's, I think for both of us, it's our biggest joy in this world is helping people recover and restore their life and restore their freedom and get pregnant and all of it. It's just like, it's amazing. So um, anything you want to add to that, Florence? No, I mean, I, I think it's, um, it's a beautiful opportunity to work on both sides because the one thing that I figured through my own recovery is that if you do the work, go all in, eat all the foods, you know, lift all restrictions, stop exercising, but you still have that negative self-talk, you still have that anxiety about your body and your health and, you know, what it means, and then you very quickly relapse because the minute you recover, your first thought is, how am I going to go back to a thinner body? And it's kind yep. of a catch 22 because you're actually making a lot of damage to your body. I mean, I, I certainly still feel some of the long-term effects of restriction and uh, it's, it's actually very, very detrimental to your body. So it's quite important to work on the mental health and what, a lot of what I do is providing tools. So it's, it's really not rocket science. A lot of what I do is just providing you tools that you can apply at home home that allow you to really reconnect with your body, have self-care in place, deal with the anxiety or the panic attacks when they come, mm -hmm. and slowly, slowly baby steps into a full recovery, which means mind and body. So I guess you're the body, I'm the mind. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Um, so that actually leads really nicely into the first question, which is from Jacqueline. Um, and she says, how do you balance encouraging health and weight without promoting diet culture? So that, I think that probably means um, sort of maybe weight control. It was a little bit unclear, but um, yeah, so I think that would be a great place to start. That's also what I understand from that question absolutely I understand kind of weight management or making sure my weight is not high or all of that kind of narrative so I uh, work on the principles of uh, health at every size so I am a member of the uh, Association for Size Diversity and Health uh, which uh, has been created for all practitioners using the health at every size principles if you've never heard of health at every size it's, um, it's a set of principles that was set up by professionals um, in the 1990s. 
Um, and they found out through a lot of research they did on dieting and restriction and weight management and, you know, weight loss, that 95% of diets actually fail in the two to five years um, time frame. So for sure, dieting works short term, but on a long term, it doesn't work. It doesn't help you actually keep that weight as low as you would but wish then for. It puts you into what they call weight cycling, which is commonly mm-hmm. known as yo-yo dieting. So you start a diet, you will stick to it. You have this high of saying, oh my God, I found the right solution. And then the restriction kind of wears off a little bit and or something will happen in your life that you cannot follow the meal plan to a T. And then you will go into binging because you have been so restricted over a certain amount of time that you just want to eat all the foods and all the carbs (laughs) and all the A lot of the times it will be easy kind of, really, um, you know, highly palatable foods and food that we consider to be unhealthy foods, because this is what brings, you know, a lot of the quick sugar um, and the the easy, the the kind of easy filling foods. Um, And then you feel horrible. You're like, oh, my God, what have I done? You go back on the diet. And every time you do that, your body actually gets back to a higher level. So what, you know, the research shows is that when you weight cycle, you create a lot more issues with your metabolism Mm -hmm. because your metabolism slows down. It's kind of hanging on to fat. It stops burning calories in the natural way to do it. Your appetite is completely deregulated. I mean, it's very serious. It, It really creates a lot of issues that would not happen had you just tried to implement health practices at the weight you were at to start with. Um, And so, you know, they even wonder now if the obesity epidemic is actually an epidemic of dieting, right? Mm -hmm. Because the more you diet, the heavier you get, and the more you start seeing issues like insulin resistance and slower metabolism, issues with heart rate and all of that. So, And then there's uh, also the there's also the self-hatred that comes along with the weight gain that leads to stress and all, you know, all of that. So the fear of foods and, you know, I can't eat that, then I really want it. What should I do? Because, you know, the body is actually made to have that diversity. So um, even in foods that we consider might not be the healthiest, uh, we definitely see benefits because of the pleasure you experience experience having them and pleasure means that you're in a relaxation response that your body will digest it properly that it will really you know help you also digest some of the nutrients you will have in other foods like pleasure is super super important we cannot disconnect it completely so if you go on diets and you have zero pleasure in them uh, it's like you can eat all the kale in the world if you actually hate it it's just proven that the nutrients will not reach your body and your metabolism. I find this mind blowing. I didn't, Mm -hmm. I didn't know that when I was, uh, you know, still stuck in, in HA land. Uh, I didn't know that not having pleasure and eating foods that I didn't like were actually not benefiting me, but it's, it's just scientifically proven. So um, basically the response to that research was to develop health at every size principle. And health at every size principles are pretty much, you know, four big principles. The first one is to accept that there is body diversity in the world and that all of us are meant to be thin. Not all of us are meant to have, uh, you know, long legs and tone bums and all of that. Um, There's different ways to be healthy. And um, the second point is that we want to basically give more importance to wellness than the weight. So it's kind of letting go of the number on the scale, letting go of the BMI, uh, letting go of all of those figures and really look at how do I feel? Like, Mm -hmm. how do I feel my body? How my body functions? Do I feel rested? Do I feel, you know, full of strength? rather than looking at, oh, but, you know, I feel horrible, but at least I have this number on the scale. That's obviously a disconnect right there. Um, The other thing to look at is looking at health from a much wider 
wider point of view. So a lot of the times we consider health in just food and exercise, okay. but food and exercise are proven to just Im kind of impact 10% of your modifiable health outcomes. A lot of those outcomes we forget about, they might be connected to which environment you live in, how stigmatized you are for your weight, um, you know, and fat discrimination is, is really something that goes on in, in the world and actually kills people because uh, some people don't get access to good health care just because they're being told, OK, go lose weight and come back. But they have serious diseases that doctors stop looking at the moment they see somebody is overweight. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to consider also, obviously, your mental health, your emotional health, uh, as I mentioned if you are very stressed out about everything but you eat all the right foods it's probably not going to benefit you um it's looking at do you have access to good health care do you have do you live in poverty are you limited in your food choices because of the amount of money that you have all of those have a huge impact on your health and we need to stop just looking at food and exercise as a de definition of health and the last point is about including joyful movement in your life. So uh, kind of in the same way, it's kind of disconnecting from, well, what is the exercise that's going to make me burn the mm -hmm. most amount of calories? It's going to be looking at, okay, if all type of movements were burning the same amount of calories, what would you choose out of pleasure? What actually makes you really happy? So for some people, it might even be gardening or walking the dog or playing with the kids in the, in the backyard. That works just fine. The main condition is that if you feel pleasure doing it, it will be sustainable, it will be durable, yes. you will do it without even noticing it, and that really brings you health. So um, that's a little bit the principle. So I know it sounds very counterintuitive for people that have never heard of that, that, OK, so to be healthy or healthier, maybe I need to get rid of the scale. Mm -hmm. I need to get rid of numbers. And it sounds completely alien, right? People are like, but no, this is not what I heard all my life. But you have to realize that there is a massive industry making money out of the insecurities we have around weight. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is very real and it reinforces, you know, the narrative that thinner is always better, that, you know, you can't be thin enough. And unfortunately, we're all here, you know, hopefully people exactly. listening to the book. Well, it is not always best, right? So, so that's a little bit something that um, it's actually a lot of what I do in my work is kind of reconnecting people to those principles. Um, and uh, it, it takes a bit of time, but I think once you understood it, once you see that it starts working with how you feel, really, once you see that, you know, you feel much better, you have more energy, you sleep better, your anxiety is better, you get to move in ways that make you happy. It's uh, it's actually very, very beneficial. And all of this is really the only evidence-based way to find health, because a lot of the dieting, a lot of the research done on the results of dieting, they are made within the one-year mark. Obviously, within one year, you can have the kind of short-term effects of dieting, which you mm -hmm. say like, this is a great result everybody kept the weight off but then look at it within two to five years all of these people will have put back the weight the weight back on or more so you know you have to be kind of more critical i would say and i, I know a lot of what you do as well is looking at research and saying okay but what are the factors that maybe might have influenced the results that we kind of forgot to yeah. uh, look at you know so um yeah so, so I, I really, it's interesting listening to you enumerate those principles because I think that I, a lot of that is sort of what I have come to as well in working with women with HA without, you know, I, I, I wrote the book before I knew anything about health at every size, but encouraging people not to focus on calories, encouraging people not to focus on their weight, getting rid of that scale is so important for recovery. Um, but even any of the other numbers, the calories, the macros, um, you know, how many steps have you had? How many, you know, all of that, like, it's just these numbers that play in our heads. And I think really um, it don't serve us very well because it keeps us focused on the food and the exercise and the body size. And there's just so much more other things that we can focus on, like our work and our family and our friends that are so much more beneficial to our overall health. So I think, I think um, 
you know, I think we're we're really speaking the same language here. And I you know I think there's just so much in diet culture where you're focused so intently on your body and what it looks like and not what it does for you. And, you know, just letting go of the the focus on the numbers, the focus on the size of pants that you're wearing, the focus. I mean, I, I now wear like yoga pants and loose flowy tops all the time because they're so comfortable and they keep me from thinking about my body all the time. Like, you know, if I wear tight pants, if I wear jeans, which I haven't worn in like years because they're so uncomfortable, it keeps me thinking about like, oh, you know, I feel this like stuff falling over my jeans and it's really uncomfortable, but I wear the yoga pants and it's like, you know, it's nothing. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just being me and I don't have to think about any of that other stuff. So, no, I think, I think, yeah. you know, when you're still kind of in that restriction mindset, it is very hard to imagine that you can get there, but um, it's really baby steps. And this is why I think coaching actually really works well. Sometimes it can be in conjunction with therapy, but coaching works well because it's really taking you into the baby steps that will slowly, slowly build up to you saying, okay, well, I don't really care, you know, because yeah. if I don't feel good in those jeans, I'm just not going to wear them. Um, so I, I, you know, I hope that um, anyone listening to this can say, okay, I can actually get there because a lot of the times we have self-limiting beliefs where we're like, well, I can never do that, you know? And I remember starting recovery and saying, but I cannot, how am I not going to weigh myself? How am I not going to do all these things? But it's not, you know, we don't ask you to do that, to do that like immediately. It's really a gradual work. And I seriously believe recovery is totally possible. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, also that, you know, reconnecting to your natural hunger and fullness cues remains the best way to be healthy and to control your weight in between brackets in the sense that your body controls it very naturally you know mm -hmm. body has the set weight that it's happy at and you might lose a little you might gain a little depending on your periods of your life but at the end of the day the body will contain continue maintaining that you know your metabolism is built for that so but when you're still in restriction you cannot go there immediately you do need in the beginning to kind of follow a, a, a bit of a schedule because yeah. your hunger and fullness cues can be completely distorted if you've been in restriction and dieting and i don't know it could be anything you know weightlifting whatever you want you're just disconnected from that natural sign that yeah. you're hungry you're full so for the beginning and definitely when you read Nicholas book you will read a lot about that too uh, it's about reassessing okay how many meals am I gonna have how many snacks am I gonna have like how do I know that you know this is enough for me to recover and having that little meal plan in the beginning, knowing that you need to feed yourself regularly is really, really important. Yeah. So I think that kind of jumps nicely into the next question. And we probably need to go a little faster because otherwise we're going to be here till three o'clock in my morning. <laughs> it's, it's almost midnight. So, um, yeah. So the, the next question is from Alice. And she's basically just asking um, about... Is there still hope for me if I make lifestyle changes? I think that this is one of the biggest things to know about HA and recovery is that there is so much hope. I mean, you know, I've seen doctors who say, oh, you have a 2% chance of getting a period back or, oh, you could gain X pounds and it's never going to come back or, you know, you're definitely going to have to use fertility treatments. Those are not evidence-based statements. I have the evidence in my book, the survey that I did of over 300 women. Um, I looked long-term once people were done with pregnancy and and breastfeeding because that that can get in the way because it, you know some people choose to use fertility treatments before they've recovered their natural cycles because okay. when you want to be pregnant most of us are not forward thinking enough to have like really worked on this beforehand and so it's like I want to be pregnant today so a lot a lot of women that took my survey you did use fertility treatments but at the end of the day, the recovery rate is about 96 to 98%, which is so Amazing. different from 2%. Like, you know, I mean, it just biologically, it doesn't make sense that our bodies would shut down and never wake up again. I mean, you think back to like our, our, our ancestors, 
I'm sure that they experienced multiple periods of starvation, you know, whether it's seasonal or, you know, there was a drought or whatever. Um, the women whose cycles didn't come back didn't have kids. And so therefore that's not in our gene pool. So our genes are based on people getting their cycles back. So I think that's really important, like that you go in thinking, not am I going to get my cycle back, but when am I going to get my cycle back? It's not an if question, it's a when question. Um, and I think that looking at it that way makes the whole process so much easier because you're going in from a place of this is going to work. It's just a question of when and exactly what I need to do. It's not a question of is it actually going to work. So I think that that's um, you know, really helpful for people as they get started on this process. Um, totally. And I think on Alice's question, I was thinking that for me, a big recovery why was my kids. Mm -hmm. um, she mentions she already has a two year old. Um, so I feel like it's just so important to me not to pass on some of the food and body anxiety that I used to have. It's yeah. important for me that my children can grow and be whatever you know, size or body that, that they are supposed to be. And for me to love them unconditionally without having that as a kind of, oh, but you need to be careful not to, oh, but you know, no, it's just a big recovery why was to do the mental health work to pass on different values to my children. Yeah. And um, for anyone watching, Florence has some really great blog posts about talking to kids about food and body image and stuff. So you should definitely go check those out. Um, so I think we'll like, we'll post, but we'll, yeah, yes. we We'll put links and I'll try and put them on the videos too. Um.